What I want to talk to you about today is uh, influenza and how we're currently, or how myself and our region within Smithfield is currently dealing with influenza. And just, uh, I don't have this in a slide, but we've got about 100,000 sows in our region uh, spread across 35 sow farms, ranging from anywhere from 750 sows to 10,000 sows on an individual farm. And so influenza is uh, obviously in our neck of the woods one of the diseases we, we get challenged with. So, so first of all, some background, and most of you should know this, is so in, influenza is a persistent pain in our system, and we call it one of the big four, so influenza, PERS, PCV2, and myco. And a lot of our challenges in really the grow-finish herd side of the business are, are somewhat PRDC, one or multiple of those pathogens involved. And we all know the challenges with influenza being an RNA virus, and it's ever-changing and eluding what we're doing. And so all the shifts and drifts that we talk about and, and uh, get described in any any topic or any presentation of influenza is shifts and drifts discussion. And there's H1N1s, H1N2s, H3N2s, and then H who knows, H, you know, stuff that evolves and changes. We've got the alpha, the betas, the gammas, the delta 1s, the delta 2s, the cluster 4As, the cluster 4Bs. I mean, this really sort of starts making your head spin when you think about it. Plus, when you throw on top of that the pandemics from 09, the human seasonal H3N2s, um, and this idea that, and, and what I get, I struggle with in our system a lot of times talking to our production personnel and other people is, oh, it's flu. Like, flu is a single entity, and it's no longer a single entity. It's all of these things. And so it's not seasonal. It's, it's not the alpha H1N1 that was always around. It doesn't occur in, you know, the months of November, December, January. It comes in, it blows to the population, and it leaves. You don't have to worry about it anymore. It's much more complex than that. So there is no season. It's a full-time disease. Um, this is not your, your grandpa's flu that they were dealing with. And then in our neck of the woods, where we've got a lot of um, poultry being grown, we've got a lot of waterfowl, and then, you know, recently the zoonotic component to it, we've had several cases of it's clear that it's human introduction into the pigs where we get a pandemic or a human seasonal H3. All of that stuff, I would tell you that flu is almost more of a pain to control than PERS is in our system, okay? And then our vaccine, what quote-unquote today, options, you know, there's some new technology that's out there that's starting to develop over the past couple of years and hopefully in the years to come, but essentially the vaccine option for influenza was it was all killed, right? You kill it, you put it in a bottle. You could get it commercially off the shelf, you could get it on autogenous, but at the end of the day it was essentially the same thing. Kill it, put it in a bottle, and, and do the best you can with a killed product. And that, that doesn't work because it constantly changes. So what I'm going to tell you about today is really based on a lot of research that's been done. And as you see these names and the time frame, it's really within the past five years that all this flu research has come out from an applied practical controlling it in the field standpoint. And a lot of that is because of the University of Minnesota, Monsi's team, uh, the work that Marie's been doing as well. And so a lot of these names that you see, Diaz and Shamba and Allerson, that, that's Monsi's team. All right. So a lot of respect goes out to, to that team developing it. So we understand that gilts are potentially a source for influenza into the south farms. We understand all the challenges with maternal antibody interference, interference when you're trying to vaccinate growing pigs. Um, we've done so, a lot of work internally to understand what the variation of that wean pig population is at the time of weaning for the amount of antibody or lack of antibody that they have maternally. Um, how that changes the infection prevalence at weaning and then also that prevalence at weaning, how that changes the dynamic of, of infection and transmission in the nursery and post weaning phase and all the struggles that you have of when do I vaccinate those pigs. Um, we talk about sow vaccination strategies, and so the work that's been done, whether it's whole herd sort of mass vaccination, whether it's a pre strategy, commercial versus autogenous strategy, or just leaving the sow herds unvaccinated and allowing influenza to come in. So, so a lot of work's been done with that. There was a good presentation uh, yesterday talking about some of the risk factors um, in the research setting. There's multiple isolates that can exist within a breed, to win, breed farm and a wean to finish farm or population. And so that isolate, not only can there be multiple isolates in the population, but those isolates can exist in that population for a very long extended period of time. So it's not like it comes in, pigs get sick, stop eating for five days, and then seven to ten days later that flu is no longer in that population. You'll actually have recrudescence of that same exact isolate in that population or in the barn next door where you've just added new pigs in a continuous flow type of setup. Um, wean pig stability and using the wean pig activity or circulation in the Farron house as a reservoir back to the naive gilts that are coming into the farm. And so it just continues to, to churn in that farm. A lot like we now understand that, that PERS acts in a sow farm and maybe mycoplasma 
and possibly PCV2. And flu should not be any different in our sow herd populations. And then this concept that I'll, I'll talk about and reference is this original antigenic sin concept of, of you've been using a certain isolate or set of isolates and vaccine in a breeding herd population, and when you come in with a new updated strain or, or a set of strains, when you actually initiate that vaccination the first time, you may not get response to what's in the bottle. Your response may be to the old isolates and not to the specific isolate, new isolates that are in the bottle. And so that, that comes into play on how we would actually vaccinate our sow herds. So what we're currently doing and, and spending a fair amount of time on is we monitor multiplication and guilt development pretty actively. So this is um, every month or twice a month, depending on it's, it's really in line with our PERS sampling and our multiplication system. We sample for PERS, we sample for influenza. Um, our goal is to protect the breeding herd. So we actively vaccinate our sows, and I'll talk about how we do that. And really a lot of this is we're trying to prevent these, these flu breaks. Um, we've had a few breaks where we've had a lot of abortions come into those herds. It's almost as bad as a PERS break. Um, and then obviously the downstream impact after those breaks occur with influenza in the post-weaning pig uh, into the wean to finish in nurseries. Our goal is to stabilize the sow farms. And then um, after a presentation at the meeting last year by uh, Bob Thompson is looking at elimination of influenza. Because we understand what the guilt status is coming in. Uh, we've got a lot of naive guilts coming in from a flu standpoint is we've got the idea that maybe we can eliminate or at least control it very well at the sow farm. Our goal for most of these diseases right now that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is just produce the most robust wean pig we can, reduce the prevalence, give that pig a fighting chance, because we continually struggle with how do we control those diseases in a grow finished population. Large sites, continuous flow sites, it's a never-ending battle. So let's start out with the best thing we can. And so that's our strategy for most of these diseases, including an increase in age and weight of that pig when it's weaned. Um, we're actively monitoring breeding herds, which we've been doing this a little bit more than a year. So every month we're testing for influenza in that weaned pig population. No different than a lot of people may do for something like PERS virus. And currently we're, um, we're utilizing and always evaluating autogenous killed vaccines. Uh, that's what we're currently using in our sows. And this is really pending the new technologies that are out there that are coming hopefully on the, on the forefront that we can then evaluate. But right now, uh, the isolates that are circulating in our system are not covered by the commercial vaccines that are out there. And so we're utilizing autogenous uh, vaccines for control. From a diagnostic standpoint, um, sort of here's a snapshot of what we may use in our system. We do a lot of oral fluids for our uh, grow finish populations, whether it's passive monitoring, just, uh, you know, we've got some sick pigs in our commercial flow, we're going to test for, for influenza using oral fluids. But in our multiplication system where we've got gilt grow out, we're actively using oral fluids to test for PERS, and we just check the box for influenza along with those same samples. Uh, snout wipes, we moved to this after we did some internal research. Um, and there's also some supporting research out there as well. Uh, we use this in our suckling pigs on our commercial and multiplication farms as a routine monitor. It allows us to sample more pigs. It's easier for the farm employees to do, and it actually has worked really well for us in the sensitivity. The only challenge with the snout wipes today is the ability to get virus isolates out of that um, material. If the CT is less than 26, it's about a 50-50 shot. And so what we'll usually do is follow up a positive test on snout wipe and actively go in and try and get nasal swabs or other samples to get influenza isolates. Uh, again, nasal swabs, and, um, they're really good, but I would tell you they're hard to do from a standpoint of just put it out in a commercial system for normal farm employees. Essentially what you get is a nasal wipe because they can't get it in the nose and they just basically wipe, you know, wipe the nostril and put it in the tube. So we figured we can get more pigs and make it easier for the farm workers to use the snout wipes. And if we have clinical cases, that have influenza and lung tissue, we'll attempt to get an isolate so it's out there, um, just so we understand we get a sequence and an isolate and know what's in our grow finish population and in the surrounding area of our sow farms. So in multiplication, we've been doing this for about four years. All of our sow farms and every site within the, the gilt grow out, whether that's nursery or a finishing site, get sampled. Um, basically, right now, we're using snout wipes in the sow farms and suckling piglets. That's 10 litters, three to five pigs per litter. And we do this every two weeks in line with our PERS testing. Our nursery and gilt finishers, it's oral fluids, at least two rows per barn. And uh, we're doing this monthly for influenza. And we've had very few instances of influenza in our multiplication system in those four years. And every case has been 
either a pandemic entry or a human seasonal H3 entry. Um, and it's pretty clear in our flow that it's, that's, what's, that's what's going on because it's not coming with the animals going into that site and say one particular nursery is positive, the other nursery that receives that same exact pig will stay negative for that entire time. So it's been very nice. We would not have been able to say that if we hadn't been monitoring consistently for a period of time. In our commercial breeding herds, we started this uh, summer of last year based off of uh, some work that we had did for about two years, understanding where were our advantages, where were our shortcomings in, in understanding influenza. And a lot of it came from the fact that our breeding herds were positive for influenza and the wean pigs were seeding the downstream. So understanding that it was not lateral infections in our growth finish population, it was vertical infection. And so we decided we're going to go in and we're going to monitor these sow herds, every sow, commercial sow herd we have. It's a monthly sampling, the same thing, 10 snout wipes, 10 litters. We target coughing litters if it's present. Uh, if not, it's just completely random. And so for we do a run a PCR on each of those 10 samples and just kind of our current rule of cutoff, if it's less than 35 on a CT, we'll attempt the sequence just so we know what's out there and compare that to our current vaccine isolates. If it's less than 30, we'll um, sequence it, which is pretty good. If it's less than 30, we're going to get a sequence off of it. Uh, pretty good response rate for that. The virus isolation, we'll attempt it. I would tell you between 26 and 30, usually we don't get a very good isolate, but we'll, we'll try. Less than 26, it's still flipping a coin. It's 50% of our isolates if the CT is less than that. So what we've done now is we'll resample. If we get something that's positive, uh, particularly if the sequence is showing us something different than what we've had, we'll go in and actively target with nasal swabs or tissues or something else to, to get those isolates. Uh, this is basically our, our 35, 36 sow farms, um, and this is just how we, we track it. So an X means that you sampled it and it was negative. The orange bars here is basically that farm did not sample within the month of June. Um, and then the blue bars are both that, that it was at least positive, and then the H and N types that we would have gotten on the PCR subtyping from those samples. All right, so that's kind of what we were, and this gets reported out every week to our production staff, so at least they're aware of what's going on. Um, so using that, our vaccination strategy currently is uh, we do two seasonal whole herds. So we target usually uh, March and September, so we're, this week we're starting our, our vaccinations. Uh, we'll do additional, if needed, on individual herds based on active, inf you know, active influenza in the wean pig, active influenza in the downstream nursery wean to finish from that sow farm, uh, or in a case like right now, the double mass vaccination if we have significantly new isolates updated in our autogenous. So what we're currently getting ready to use, we change both isolates out of our vaccine, they're significantly different. We're going to go in with two whole or mass herds um, to try and overcome that original antigenic sin concept. In addition to that, we will do pre ferro um, Usually it's two to three weeks pre ferro We've got a couple of P1 guilt farms, and so those herds are never static, and so we, we actively vaccinate them pre ferro And then herds that are unstable, again, positive wean pigs, challenging downstream production. Not only will we do double mass vaccination, for a period of time until their stability, we'll actively pre vaccinate those as well, just to try and booster that maternal immunity that's in those pigs in the Farron house. Um, our current autogenous strategy is we target the most prevalent and consistent isolates across our system, and that's across flows and geography, so we don't get hung up on that flow that's had 10 submissions because it's a challenge and we got flu out all 10 submissions. That doesn't mean there's, that it's 10% you know, prevalence, for example. So we, we take into account the flow. We also, we're pretty spread out. We've got farms in Virginia and North Carolina and some of our pigs flow up to Pennsylvania. And even in North Carolina, we're, we're spread out pretty, pretty good. So, so we look at sort of the geographical relationship where these farms are and then also where those pigs flow in that geography. Um, we prioritize candidates from the sow farm monitoring. So our goal, we're vaccinating sow farms. Um, I'll get to it, we're not vaccinating growing pigs. So the vaccines in the sow farm so I want the isolates that are coming from the sow farm, all right? We'll still look at the growth finish population and what isolates we have, but for updated vaccine use, we want to use those isolates that are circulating in the wean pig and those sow farms. Um, we're comparing current vaccine isolates uh, with the current field isolates and um, both monitoring the isolates and clinical growing cases, so what's actively coming out of the sow farm, but again, also what's coming in tissue workups from the field, um, from the growth nursery and grow finish herds. 
And if, if we're concerned about whether they're cross-protective of the vaccines, we may do some cross-HIs at the University of Minnesota. Just to understand what level of protection should we expect with a new isolate to what we're currently vaccinating with. Um, we evaluate the sow herd response to new isolates and formulations. So we do a lot, uh, well, I wouldn't say a lot, but it seems like I do more than some of my other um, veterinarians in our system, a lot more homologous HI evaluation for our vaccines. When we change vaccines, are we getting a response specific to what's in the bottle? Or are we getting a response to something else? And I want to see really high titers. I want to try and maximize those in the sows and then transfer those into the wean pig and give them, again, the most robust wean pig that I can produce out of that sow farm. And in the event that we've got an isolate that doesn't match what we're currently doing from an autogenous, um, if it matches one of the commercial vaccine isolates a lot better, we'll go and purchase some commercial vaccine off the shelf and put it into that particular sow herd. And we did that once this past year where we had an H3 come in that, that was uh, significantly different than what we were currently utilizing in our autogenous. And we went in and just double mass vaccinated that sow herd. And luckily that was one of our... Um, uh, one of our herds that we were monitoring a little bit more intently because we were going through a PERS closure. Um, so we did some additional testing there, and we looks like we've kind of walked that isolate out of that farm by doing that. So, um, Growing pig vaccination, I alluded to this. We're not vaccinating growing pigs. Uh, the challenge is maternal interference, as, as we all should be aware of uh, with vaccinating with influenza. Um, you know, this quote of, well, you just start vaccinating pigs when maternal antibodies decay at 10 weeks of age. How many people have heard that, right? Man, that is such a loaded statement there. Um, you know, decay varies by age type, whether it's H1 or H3. There's so much variation in the level of maternal antibodies that exist in that wean pig population that it's not a hard 10 weeks. By the time you get to 10 weeks of age, in a lot of our continuous flow nurseries, those pigs have seen multiple types of flu already, so what's the point of vaccinating those pigs? Um, it just really has not been a very good ROI on trying to vaccinate growing pigs. So again, we're not doing that today. Now that may change going forward if we have some new technology that comes out that allows us to, to break through this um, maternal interference, then, then we'll evaluate that when it comes to it. But today we don't really have that. So in summary, flu continues to be a significant pathogen in our system. Um, in some cases, it's much more difficult to handle and deal with than something like PERS. At least with PERS, we kind of have a plan and, and a strategy and things have been working for us. Influenza is always changing. The strategies are always changing. Um, and at times, it can cost us as much as, as PERS in our system. Um, plus the challenges of having this conversation with, with our production team and our farm managers of, well, it's just flu, right? I mean, I dealt with flu 20 years ago when I had it in my south farm in Kentucky. It's just flu. We don't, I mean, it's just flu. And you're like, all right, uh, this, is, this is a much bigger conversation than that. Um, many layered challenges with controlling the disease. Focus is on breeding herds again at this time, uh, stabilizing that wean pig. We do not have the tools currently to effectively and consistently control flu. I think that message has kind of been, been churning for the past maybe three to five years, really since the, the pandemic challenge in 2009. A lot of people have stood up and said, look, what we have out there today is not working. We need something new. And I think some of the new technology that's out there that's on the horizon is really because of those discussions we've had. Um, and we'll continue to support and evaluate those new technologies as they become available.